All right, hi, welcome back to PS101, Introduction to Astronomy. Uh, this is the summer online version. Uh, we are in week two, part one, uh, motions of the planets. We uh, are gonna talk a little bit about the planets of our solar system and talk about some laws of motion we can derive from that and things we can learn from observing the planets. Uh, we won't get too much into the details about the planets of the solar system um, themselves. Uh, there is another course you can take for that if you're at St. A's, PS201 or 202. I don't remember the course number, <laughs> uh, but it's called Planetary Science in the Physics Department. It's a lower 200 level course um, if you're interested in that kind of thing. So we're going to talk about Kepler's laws. Uh, this, uh, If you're working along with the worksheets, we're going to start with the one called Kepler's second law. Before we get into Kepler and what that is, um, brief, super brief overview of the planets of our solar system. Sorry, no, Pluto's not a planet. Deal with it. I, I'm sorry. No, I'm not really sorry. Uh, do, Pluto is a dwarf planet. We can have that, we have that discussion in a uh, planetary science course. Um, but the eight classical planets uh, are shown in an illustration here. These are to scale by size, but not by distance. Uh, to the Sun. Here we have the Sun over on the left, and then Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. For small rocky terrestrial planets, for larger gas giants. Uh, many of these planets are visible to us with the naked eye. Um, planets known to us in the ancient times were Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They're all shown in this picture here, except for Saturn. Um, planet came from the word meaning wanderer because these points of light did not stay fixed with the rest of the stars and constellations. They moved among the constellations. Uh, also included in this category were the sun and moon, which we no longer consider planets. Um, Mercury is kind of difficult to see because it's always super close to the sun in the sky. Um, so you can see it close to sunset or sunrise like it is here. In this particular picture, Mars and Jupiter are also pretty close, but they can venture much further from the sun. So they can be seen at other times uh, of the night. Mars is not always bright, but here in summer of 2018, as this course is first running, uh, Mars is actually quite bright in the eastern-ish sky. Um, oh man, I saw it the other night. It must have been around 11 p.m., pretty high up. Um, so still a reasonable time you can see this bright red Mars. Jupiter is always uh, pretty bright as well. Saturn is quite bright. Venus uh, is also fairly close to the sun. So it um, can be seen again at sunset in the west or before sunrise in the east. That is a super bright planet. Uh, in fact, it is responsible for a ridiculous percentage of UFO reports. They actually turn out to be people seeing Venus because uh, it's really spectacularly bright and, and occasionally low on the horizon. Um, so uh, like I mentioned, uh, these move across the sky differently than the stars, whereas the stars uh, we've talked about how the celestial sphere appears to rotate, but all those stars stay, f stay fixed with respect to each other. Whereas these planets, and these are month and day, so this is a May 30th of some year, June, July, August, September, October, November. Um, this is uh, the path of a planet uh, through the sky over the course of many months. It moves slightly from night to night. Um, it's not super easy to, to track unless you're, you're paying attention, um, but it does move compared to the background stars. You see this one, it makes a loop-de-loop. -loop. This one, it does this zigzaggy thing. We'll talk about the intricacies of that coming up. But suffice to say, these planets move on their own and observations of these motions of the planets let early astronomers figure out some things about our solar system and our place in it. Um, figuring out that the sun was at the center of the solar system. They thought the center of the universe, but we will find out later we are not that. Um, and the planets rotate around the sun, all the planets, including Earth. And by measuring carefully these positions over time, 
uh, an astronomer by the name of Kepler was able to derive these three laws of motion. Where a law is, in, in science, a description of how something works over and over and over again. It's not a hypothesis because it doesn't guess at how something works. It's not a theory because it doesn't, again, it doesn't, it doesn't explain why something works. Um, but it does uh, tell us, uh, it describes observations, basically. The first of these laws is that all the planets orbit around the sun in an ellipse. So it's not a perfect circle, it's this stretched out circle called an ellipse. The sun is at one focus of the ellipse. Uh, you'll get to do some um, lab exercises explaining a little bit more about what ellipses are, how you can draw them, their geometrical properties. Um, but suffice to say, sun's not super at the center uh, and the planet is not in a perfectly circular orbit. We can define an ellipse by the length across it that's the longest. Half of that is called the major axis, called A. And uh, across the smallest part is the minor axis, and half of that uh, is called B. Um, so it's basically an elongated circle where if a, this was a circle, this length would equal this length, right? It'd be the radius all around. Um, but we're going to pay attention to um, this major axis going forward. So Kepler's first law, planets orbit the sun in ellipses. Kind of a big deal historically because it was presumed that they orbited in perfect circles. His second law has some funny wording, um, which takes a bit of unpacking. The wording is, as a planet moves around its orbit, it sweeps at equal area and equal time. What the heck does that mean? Basically, it means a planet travels faster when it is nearer to the sun and slower when it is further. And this diagram gives you an example. So if planet moves through slice A, so it goes from this point to this point, the amount of time it takes to go there, if I find the area of this shape, it's not quite a triangle, it's like a bendy triangle, and I trace out another shape somewhere else in its orbit that's equal the same area, so the area of these blue sort of triangles are all equal to each other, takes the same amount of time to do this, whoops, as it does to do this chunk, as it does to do this chunk. What do you notice? This path is longer. This path is medium length. This path is short. But because I've defined it by these areas, I've said the time it takes to do those little paths is equal. So if it takes the same amount of time to go this long path as it does to go this short path, hey, that means it's going faster here and slower here. So the equal area, equal time law, um, as it's described, um, really brings us down to this fact that planets are going faster when they're in the part of the orbit that's closer and slower when they're further away. In fact, they're going the fastest when they're the closest. So speeds up, speeds up, going fastest. Starts to slow down, slow down, slow down, slow down. Going the slowest when it's further away. And then speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up, fastest. Um, this will start to make sense when we talk about the laws of gravity, but this was what Kepler observed um, without being able to describe. So the highlights for this. Uh, planets move among the stars on the celestial sphere. They wander amongst the constellations. Uh, observing the motions of the planets led to a, that should be model, good, good on me, I can spell, look at that, I can change it in real time, <laughs> model of the solar system with the sun at the center. Uh, the planets orbit the sun in ellipses with the sun at one focus of the ellipse, and the planets move faster in their orbit when they're closer to the sun than when they're further away. So moving on to the next section, if you're doing, going along with the worksheets, Kepler's third law. Uh, is the topic of the next one. This law says, oh, well, for a quick review, orbits are ellipses, first law. Second law deals with one planet's motion over time as it goes around the sun. Kepler's third law compares the motions of different planets at different distances from the sun. So two and three are gonna sound the same f at first, but note that Kepler's second law talks about, I'll skip back, one planet going around, 
whereas Kepler's third law is going to start to compare these planets to each other. So the third law, ah, equation, um, don't have to memorize this equation. Those of you who are mathematically inclined may enjoy seeing an equation. What this says is there is a mathematical relationship between the orbital period of a planet, how long it takes to go around, and their average distance to the sun, which is um, A here, the, um, well, yeah, A, a the, the average distance from the sun in astronomical units. Hey, it's also equal to that semi-major axis in our ellipse. So roughly distance. So for the Earth, um, this is 93 million miles, about, which in a system of units called AU, or astronomical units, is one. <laughs> and AU is defined as the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. Cool. So AU is a useful unit when we talk about planets in the solar system. Some planets are, if say a planet is 5 AU away from the Sun, that means it's five times the distance between the Earth and the Sun. P, the orbital period, is years. So uh, for Earth, we define a year as how long it takes to go around our orbit once. So for Earth, if you plug in a one here and a one here, one squared equals one cubed, one equals one. Hey, that works. This works for all the other objects in our solar system as well. You put in their average distance from the sun and you can do some uh, algebra to figure out its period and vice versa. Here is a diagram showing you, um, this is uh, not a depiction of our solar system, but a depiction of another solar system where the law kind of works the same. If you have uh, the star in the middle and you have these planets in these orbits that are gradually bigger, you can measure these little lines here are showing, well, these are not quite the average distance, but you can figure out the average distance for each one of these planets and figure out their period that way. For the sun, uh, excuse me, for, yeah, for the sun, for our solar system, we can graph that. So this is the size of the orbit um, in astronomical units. Uh, so here's zero right up on the sun. One is probably like here. Uh, Ju so that would be Earth, Jupiter's here, Saturn's here. You can start to go out to things like Neptune and Pluto further out. This axis is showing the orbital speed. So we can use the period and its distance to figure out a speed. This shows us that stuff close to the sun is moving much faster. So the Earth at about one astronomical unit, did, 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 did is uh, it's about 30, I think it's a little over 30, I think it's 33 um, kilometers per second is how fast we go around the sun. Think about that for a second. The Earth you are sitting on right now <laughs> is moving at 33 kilometers per second. I know kilometers and miles, whatever. We're not used to that here in, in, in America, USA. Um, but kilometer is, is a distance, a long distance. If you ever run a 5K, takes a bit to run five of them. We're going 30 of those every second. We the planet. So pretty cool. As you get further from the sun, your average orbital speed decreases. So out here, I think Saturn is at about 10. It's orbiting the sun at about 10 kilometers a second. So quite a bit slower than the Earth is. So the highlight for that, right, there's a mathematical relationship between the planet's distance from the sun and how long it takes to go around. And the conclusion from that is that planets travel more slowly around the sun the further away they are. This is why I said you want to make sure you keep in mind that third law compares different planets to each other because it's saying closer to sun, faster, further from sun, slower, which is what Kepler's second law is also saying but that's for one planet in elliptical orbit. So both of these things are true. Um, when a planet is closer to the sun, it moves faster than when it's further away. Pretty cool. So uh, next up, I wanted to talk about retrograde motion because not all of these planets move in straight lines through the constellations, as I showed you before. Uh, these are these tracks, these positions showing Mars. It's chugging along the sky in a particular direction, that particular direction is eastward. 
So from night, excuse me, from night to night, the planet appears to be a little further east than it was the night before. Sometimes it goes backwards the other way, westward, and then it goes eastward again. Here again, we have east, 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 west, 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 east, 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 east. This backwards motion or going back the other way is called apparent retrograde motion. This motion uh, caused a lot of problems for early scientists, astronomers, philosophers who wanted to put the Earth at the center of the universe. Because um, you can imagine the sun going around and you can imagine the stars going around, but how do you explain these planets doing these loopy things as they go around us? This actually makes more sense when you put the sun at the center of the solar system. You, uh, if you're taking this class, you will be doing a lab uh, exploring this in much more detail uh, in addition to doing the in-class or uh, the, the worksheet activity. Um, but here's the general overview. For each of these positions of the Earth, so they're numbered one, the Earth's here in its orbit. Yeah, I realize this is in Greek. Uh, <laughs> one, there's Mars in its orbit. And then imagine a line of sight from Earth to Mars to the background stars, particularly stars along the ecliptic, because, hey, planets move along the ecliptic like the sun does. Cool. Back up a sec. So that one, so that could be, say, that location there. That's one. Two would be the next position. So give it a month. Uh, give it a little less than a month. Uh, maybe this is three weeks. <laughs> um, so there, let's move from here to here. It's moving a little bit faster than Mars. Mars has moved from here to here, so it's covered less distance. But we can draw that line of sight, two to two to two. There's that two dot. So maybe that's, so it's going eastward, it's going to this dot. Actually, no, sorry. It's going to this dot, something like that. Let's do it again. I'm just going to leave this one up because this is that curve against the background that we're looking at. Three, 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 four, four, four. All of this, we see this, the, the planet Mars is slowly moving eastward throughout the sky. Until we get to point five. Five, five, five. It was going east, 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 and now it's going west. Six, 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 still going west. Seven, seven, seven. Oh, it's going east again. Eight, eight, eight. Nine, nine, nine. So something happens when the Earth passes Mars in its orbit, because it's going slightly faster because of Kepler's third law. Um, it changes how Mars appears to move in the sky. It makes it look like it's moving backwards when really we're turning this way, they're turning this way. They're not, Mars isn't doing any wiggles through the solar system. A realistic example, a more realistic, uh, more familiar example would be on a highway. If you are, um, don't do this if you're the driver, if you're the driver, pay attention to driving. If you're a passenger in a car on a highway and you're going along in the left lane, you're going along in the left lane, right? So this is talking about driving in a country where we drive on the right side of the road, for those of you watching internationally. Um, if you pass, you've got slow moving truck, so you go to pass the truck in the left lane, if you're the passenger and you look at that truck, it looks like the truck is moving backwards, right? It looks like it's going backwards, but you know you're going forward at, we'll be, we'll be polite, 65 miles an hour, and the truck's going 60 miles an hour, so you're both moving forward. But from your point of view in the faster car in the left lane, that truck looks like it's moving backwards. That's the same effect that you get um, living on a planet Earth that's going around the solar system at a certain speed, looking out at these other planets. It makes them appear to have this loop-de-loop -loop motion. So the highlight here, planets move among the stars, but that motion can be irregular. Retrograde motion is the occasional backwards motion of a planet amongst the stars, and it's best described uh, and modeled by having one planet pass more quickly by another to see that retrograde motion. So we've described these planetary motions a bit, but we haven't talked about why they happen. Um, fundamental 
study of astronomy involves gravity. And gravity was uh, first well described by Newton's laws. Newton's laws, again, are uh, descriptions or observations, uh, but it gives us a little bit more insight into what's happening. All right, again, equation time. Again, don't super worry about the details of these equations. I won't have you doing calculations. But it is one way of understanding how these different quantities are related. So I wanted to measure the strength of gravity between two objects. Here's object one, here's object two. It could be the sun and a planet. It could be two asteroids. It could be, I don't know. Oh, look, I have bouncy balls. <laughs> It could be these two things. They are gravitationally attracted to each other, but it's super weak, so you can't tell unless things are really big, like asteroids and planets. Let's pretend, uh, let's pretend it's a planet and a moon. We'll go with that. So say M1 is a planet, M2 is a moon. There's a, an attractive force between these two things because they have mass. The amount of mass, or the amount of stuff in object one, the planet, the amount of stuff in object two, the moon, uh, if you have more stuff in either one, the force goes up. So force is directly related to the mass of both objects. The force of gravity decreases the further away these get from each other. So the distance between these two objects is this little r. Sometimes it's an r, sometimes it's a little r, sometimes it's a big r, sometimes it's a d. Uh, but it's just the distance between these two things. The force of gravity decreases as you pull these things away from each other. They feel each other less strongly. So the R is on the bottom. It's inversely proportional, or R squared is inversely proportional to the forces. Notice that the forces are equal. The force of mass one on mass two is equal to the force of mass two and mass one. So two objects, a large object and a small object, actually put equal force on each other. It's a little bit of a strange concept because that's like saying, I put an equal amount of gravitational force on the Earth that the Earth puts on me. But it's true. The effects of that force are what are different, which I'll get to in a second. But um, just know that the forces between two objects, the gravitational force between two objects is equal and in opposite directions. If these you know, two are in a stable configuration. This big G here is just a constant, bunch of numbers, don't have to worry about. We're gonna focus on the relationships. So the masses and the distances. And it's the distance squared, which means you change the distance a little, changes the force a lot. When you're using that to understand how some system works, um, it's good to think about a concept known as center of mass. So these two objects in this example, one is not much bigger than the other. It's a little bit bigger than two. That means these two objects, instead of thinking of the small one orbiting the big one, come to, come to me, Right, instead of thinking of the small one orbiting the big one because they're close in size, they both orbit each other, right? Or we say they orbit a common center of mass or center of gravity. There's some point in between them that they are, some imaginary point they're orbiting. That point's gonna be closer to the big mass than to the smaller mass. That's why I have the big ball moving in a smaller circle than the little ball but they will affect each other. However, when this gets really big and this gets really small, what do you think happens? This circle gets smaller, this circle gets bigger. When you compare a planet and the sun, if you remember way back from here, big old sun, teeny tiny planets, um, the sun's not gonna move a whole lot. The planets, which are much, much smaller than the sun, even Jupiter is much smaller than the sun, is going to be making, doing most of the motion and the sun is just gonna kind of wiggle a little bit. The center of mass of that system is inside the sun itself. That'll become important in week four. So hang on to that for that. Uh, Newton has uh, three laws of motion in addition to the laws of gravity. I'm gonna just touch on those briefly because they do come into play a little bit in some of the activities and worksheets. Uh, you'll be doing if you're taking this this online course. 
Um, the first law of motion is that an object moves at a constant velocity unless there is a net force acting on it to change its speed or direction. It means an object that in, is in motion will stay in motion, an object at rest will stay at rest, unless you give it a push or a pull. So that's good to keep in mind. Second law is that the force of something equals the mass times the acceleration. So baseball player throwing a ball, um, baseball is pretty small, they can give it a certain amount of force, they're gonna get an acceleration out of that baseball. Uh, if you change that baseball to a softball, which is larger, uh, and give it the same amount of force, it's gonna have less acceleration. That's gonna come into play when we talk about little objects orbiting big objects. So the little object, so small mass, right? So the, okay, back up a step. If the force between two objects, go back here. If the force, gravitational force between two objects is equal, that means the product of their mass and acceleration is equal. So if one has a teeny tiny mass, and the other has a big, big mass, guess what? The one with the teeny tiny mass has to have a big, big acceleration. It's gotta be booking it. It's gotta be moving a lot. The one with the big mass is gonna have a small acceleration. Big, massive thing, harder to move. So it's not going to accelerate as much. Again, keep that in mind uh, as if you're working through the worksheets and the labs later on. The third law of motion, for every force, there's an equal and opposite reaction force. Uh, this is demonstrated by rockets. Uh, it is shooting uh, material and exhaust out one end at a stupidly high velocity, uh, which will cause this bulky mass of rocket and space shuttle to go in the other direction. Um, these are things you've come aware of in your everyday life, but you don't even realize it because it's the things that govern, the laws that govern the motion of things around us. Some highlights for this. The force of gravity between two objects is opposite, meaning opposite directions, but equal. The force depends on the mass of both, the gravitational force particularly, depends on the mass of both objects and the distance between them. And the motion of objects in the solar system and in the universe is defined by these gravitational forces. So we are gonna keep these forces in mind with everything that we talk about in this course because gravity is kind of the dominant shaping force of the large things in the universe. Even though it's the weakest force, um, it does affect everything. That's it for this mini lecture. I will see you on the discussion boards.